That being said, my job is done here other than to watch for questions. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Rita McBride and Vicki Castleman. You can't see my hand across here. <laughs> but if, if you young ladies would like to tell me a little bit about yourself, your companies, how you came to be such experts in the field, and then we'll go ahead when you're ready and we'll start up the presentation. We'll start with Vicki. We'll start with Vicki. Excellent. Thank you. I turn off my phone. Hold on. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vicki Castleman, as Jay mentioned, and I am the franchise owner for the Home Instead Senior Care that services the Sun City and Peoria areas um, of the Valley. Um, I'm happy to be in Arizona. I am a transplant after living in Nebraska my first 50 years. I uh, moved here about a year ago with my husband and we purchased this Home Instead franchise um, in order to uh, serve uh, this community, which was special to me because I actually spent a lot of time visiting Sun City in my youth. My grandfather lived in Sun City. So when the opportunity presented itself for us to move here, I kind of felt like it was divine intervention. And we're pleased to be here working with the community and able to um, offer our services, uh, which I'll go into more in a few minutes, which is about in-home care. Um, and before I, I move on, I just also wanted to acknowledge um, my uh, colleague, Julie Hebner, who is also on the line, and uh, she owns the Home Instead franchise that services um, Surprise and Sun City West. So Julie and I are kind of a tag team in working with the community, um, and so she may pipe in a little bit throughout the conversation as well, but I'm pleased to be here and excited to, to share some information with everybody today. Awesome. Julie, can we get you to raise your hand so everybody on the screen sees you? Yes. Hello, Fantastic. Hello. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. Thanks, Vicky. And hi, I am Rita McBride. I am the owner of A Better Solution for Senior Living. And um, coincidentally, I first started my foray into the senior industry working for Home Instead Senior Care. I worked for them from um, the early 2000s till about 2005. And for the last 16 years, I have been a placement agent. Um, I live here in the Valley. We moved here in 2000. We live up in the Anthem area. Uh, when I say we, it's just my husband and I, we've got grown children and um, just have always loved working in, this, in the senior world, so. That's it. Excellent. All right. Well, are there any questions ahead of time before we get started? Otherwise, we'll uh, jump right into the presentation. Okay. There we go. Great. So we'll start that from the beginning. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you, Jay. So I'm going to start um, today's presentation and share a little bit about in-home care, but Reed and I spoke ahead of time and we're really excited to be able to do this opportunity together because we think that our two concepts really go hand in hand. And I think by the end of this um, time together, you'll understand better what I mean by that. Um, so Home Instead really spends time identifying caregivers to come into the home to help take care of our seniors. And I found Home Instead because my own mother was a caregiver. And so um, it's sometimes funny what paths our life take, but um, without her becoming a caregiver in her retired years, um, I would have never chosen my own career in um, senior care as well. Um, I worked at the corporate headquarters out of Omaha, Nebraska for about 12 years before purchasing the franchise here in Sun City. So I've been close to Home Instead and the care we provide for, for a lot of years. Um, so Jay, go ahead and go forward. So I just thought it would be kind of um, fun to take an informal poll. I'm not asking for anybody to jump on the line, but um, a question that kind of sets the tone of um, what we're here to solve for is, is this. And it's, it's really the question about how many of you would prefer to age at home? Go ahead and you can click, yep. So you can kind of think through yourself like, okay, if I had my choice, would I prefer to age in my own home that I've been living in for so many years, or would I prefer to have to move out in my own setting? Go ahead and go. Yeah. So 
I'm hoping that your answers, had we actually had you here to raise your hand, would align to what this, uh, what these results tell us. And um, I provided a couple of um, surveys from some different expert resources. You can go ahead and page forward one. Um, so according to AARP, um, when asked this question, roughly 90% of American seniors wish to live at home for as long as possible. And um, again, I underlined the for as long as possible because sometimes situations change. It, situations change. We try to honor that wish for as long as possible. And again, that's where when Rita shares her information, you'll understand how sometimes um, we have to make different decisions as um, the aging process continues. Go ahead and click again. And uh, just to continue with that kind of information, um, I provided an additional stat just kind of from another resource um, that validating the fact that in this particular survey, 88% of Americans um, said, yes, if I'm going to age at age, I want to age at home or in the home of someone that is um, a loved one to me. So today I'm gonna to spend some time talking about home instead in um, the in-home care business. Um, I am one of many solutions that are available in in-home care. Home instead is, a, is um, an example of a franchise system and business that offers the option to stay independent at home. So here are some of the things I'm going to talk through today. First, we're gonna talk just about the uh, variety of in-home services that we make available to our seniors. Um, we're gonna help you identify when home care may be a needed solution. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about conversation starters with a loved one. Um, and I'm also gonna give you some tips on how to select an in-home care provider and what that process may look like. So a little bit about um, in home care. Home care um, is easily kind of divided into these three categories. The first category I refer to as companionship home helper services. Um, and it probably will be exactly what it sounds like. Um, this is coming in, helping make sure that we're providing um, companionship, uh, conversation, um, reducing some of that isolation that our seniors may feel and helping them with some errands. That second bucket um, is what we call personal services. And this is really when the care gets to be more hands-on. And then um, most of the in-home care services also provide another layer of care of specialized care. And this could be for some advanced uh, dementia behaviors, for instance, or sometimes couples care. <laughs> Big hard thing takes a minute. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> there we go. So let me just explain a little bit um, deeper on um, what some of these topics may include. Um, because sometimes it's like, okay, I didn't really know or think that they could also go do this service for me. So again, companionship services, um, this is conversation, socialization, taking a senior to different activities that they enjoy doing. Maybe they wanna to go to the bridge club. Um, maybe they wanna to go to the rec center and go walk in the pool. Those are types of companionship services that we can offer. Home helper services include things like laundry, um, changing the bedding, maybe preparing some fresh meals, um, helping take out the pets, um, all of these things that help keep a home safe, a home clean, a home healthy uh, for a senior to age um, in an uh, environment that is best uh, meeting their needs. Um, we know um, that sometimes it makes it difficult to start preparing those meals or keep those healthy meals coming. And um, you know that's where a caregiver can come in and make sure we're putting together a couple of solutions so you're not having to eat the frozen meals or eat canned soup every day. Um, transportation services. Um, we get called on often to help take people to appointments. Um, think of um, preparing for a surgery, post-surgery, 
Um, just typical appointments. Um, I think we all have our own share of doctor visits, dentist visits that are part of our healthy um, plan of care. Um, but we also can help just running other errands, whether it's picking up prescriptions, running to get groceries, um, or maybe taking um, a senior to go visit a family member or a friend. Again, the personal services, this is where it becomes hands-on. We can do dressing, bathing, toileting, helping with transfers, bed care. Um, a lot of things start to fall into that category. And then lastly, those specialized topics is when we start, are starting to get into working with equipment in the home. Think of Hoyer lifts, sometimes it's couples care, um, maybe that advanced dementia or hospice support. I'm going to take a little sip here. So I like this particular slide because I think it does a nice job of just expressing how when we go into a situation or to a home setting where we really try to give it a holistic um, review to make sure that we're not missing any opportunities. Um, sometimes people call us and say, oh, I only need somebody to come in and help my mom shower. And so their, their vantage point is they're, they're addressing the personal care items, but they haven't thought about things like, is the environment that um, she's living in or that you're living in is safe? Uh, we talked about nutrition and their meals. So this particular um, eight care needs slide really does a nice job of holistically showing a lot of the different things that could get overlooked. And so a lot of, like I mentioned, sometimes people call, it starts with one thing in mind. And the next thing it's like, oh, yep, that's right. We have appointments. Medication is an issue. Okay, we also need to get some meals prepared. And this allows us to make sure we're doing a full spectrum of the appropriate amount of care um, in the homes when we go in. So why we're waiting, why uh, we're here on this slide, we're going to just take another informal poll. And the next question I wanted you to think about is it's a true or false question. True or false, lack of social connection heightens an individual's health risks. So it may seem really obvious, but I wanted to point it out because it's absolutely true. Um, it is becoming more and more apparent that um, when people are isolated or not getting that social interaction, it can actually be the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Go ahead and page forward. And in addition to that, the effects of um, prolonged isolation can start to affect mood, um, depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. So again, I think sometimes we focus on the things like showering and we minimize the importance of how nice it is to have someone there to sit and have a meal with you or to come in and make sure that you're being engaged in conversation and staying connected to day-to-day -day dialogue. Um, without these things, we're seeing a rapid shift in our senior population where we're seeing more mood disorders or depression um, that may start to set in. Um, this has become more and more apparent. Um, go ahead and go forward one. Um, especially in light of COVID-19. Um, and I introduced this here kind of because these two topics go somewhat together, right? Never before, probably in at least my lifetime and probably many people on the line's lifetime, have we been met with the time where we have been isolated from people we love or interact with um, due to a pandemic that has forced us to, um, you know, re minimize contact and stop the spread of the disease. Um, so those impacts of social isolation that I just highlighted in that last poll have become especially prevalent in the last 18 months um, as we've been working with um, seniors and having conversations with families um, because of this whole new situation where people have been more isolated than ever before. So um, I, I'm going to 
change gears a little bit, go ahead and go back one and just kind of talk about how do we prepare for uh, COVID-19 when we're going into a home care setting. Um, one, we're very in tune to the social isolation concerns, but we also know that um, we need to be in there to provide the care that many people are asking us for. So we have to take a lot of new precautions. Um, those precautions include um, that we're training all of our caregivers on um, hand washing and other universal precautions. Um, we help to um, make sure that we have the appropriate PPE available. So masks, hand sanitizer, um, gloves, um, anything that um, a caregiver may need to appropriately deliver care. Um, we also are managing any return to work timelines or guidelines based on illnesses that our caregivers may be reporting to us so that they're not introduced into a home care setting too soon. So we follow CDC guidelines there. We also screen our caregivers before they go into a client visit. They have to answer a set of questions before we even allow them in. So um, this is really kind of just an opportunity for me to say like, we really take the COVID-19 um, pandemic very seriously. And as we're introducing a home, introducing our services into a home care setting, these are some of the things that we do to minimize the spread of the disease, but still be able to provide our services. So now I'm gonna shift gears and have you start thinking about um, determining when a loved one um, may need care. And I, selected three kind of overarching categories here. One, and this is pretty common, is it's a medical condition or a medical emergency that drives a phone call to us. And, um, you know, we're always happy to help and we're able to respond quickly and, um, you know, typically able to come in and, and provide those solutions. But um, think of, Oh, so and so fell, they broke a hip, they, they're coming out of rehab, now I need to get them home. That medical emergency has really driven this need or this interest in in home care. Um, very appropriate, um, but there are other things that may be going on ahead of that fall that may drive a call to um, an in home care provider even sooner. Um, the second topic there is really about just. Um, the inability to take care of regular activities. So um, maybe they're not able to get to the grocery store anymore to buy the, the fresh fruits and vegetables and to prepare the meals, or you're noticing expired foods um, in a home. Um, uh, you're recognizing that there's uh, more difficulty with, with walking um, or um, they aren't showering as regularly as they used to be. And so you notice hygiene is starting to um, transition for an individual. Those are all examples of typical activities that may be happening for a person or that they've done for themselves for 70, 80, maybe sometimes longer years. And suddenly they cease or they start to um, lessen. Um, that's a great time to start calling us. And the third most common reason that someone reaches out for assistance is really um, maybe you're a primary caregiver of somebody that's facing one of the two other situations I just described and you're needing a break or you need to go on a vacation to um, go visit family for a, a family event. Um, again, that's a great time to reach out to in-home care and have them come in, um, whether it's a short-term uh, respite break or just more of a regular uh, weekly you know, two or three times a week, I'd like to be able to go out and have lunch with my friends, um, go to my own appointments, run to the store by myself without having to worry about it. And then I can come home and be a caregiver again to my loved one. So I mentioned some of these previously, but these are more tactical things that you can be looking for on if you need an in-home caregiver. Um, so again, sometimes the appearance of um, more difficulty with walking or standing or recent falls, um, sometimes we're lucky and somebody has a fall, they don't get seriously injured, but it is definitely a warning sign or a precursor that um, more care may be needed or um, someone should be coming in to um, ensure someone's safety and check on the home environment to make sure it's safe. 
Um, we talked about the poor grooming or personal hygiene and seeing some changes in those regards. Um, changes in their eating, cooking, um, seeing those expired foods. One that a lot of people hate talking about, but it's a, it's a common conversation that has to come up between family members is diminished driving skills. Um, you know, either eyesight's changing and suddenly there's a bump on the fender or, um, you know, I don't feel comfortable driving at night anymore because I can't see well at night. Um, I know my own personal family situation, my mother has macular degeneration, so she doesn't drive at all anymore, but it started with not being able to drive at night and now it's completely loss of driving. Um, we talked a little bit about social, um, the mood changes and not socializing. Uh, memory loss, forgetfulness also starts to show up. Um, medication adherence is common that we're in trying to assist people to take medications on a regular schedule, especially if they're post-surgery and getting people to those appointments on time. So these are all things that may be signs that in-home care could be um, of importance. So I don't know if how many of you um, may have either experienced this in having to talk to your own parents or having your own children trying to talk to you, but um, sometimes having that talk about aging can be very uncomfortable. Um, so following this presentation, um, I have provided Jay with an aging resource guide that will be sent to all of you. Um, and within that aging resource guide, it's really a toolkit of different um, aspects of your life that can be evaluated, but also it gives great conversation tips. Some from the um, perspective of being maybe an adult child and others from the perspective of being the senior. Um, it's hard for me, I can say this because I'm an adult child of a 86 year old mother. It's hard for me sometimes to figure out the right words to talk to my mom and express like I shared the driving story, but it's an important conversation that I knew I needed to have. Likewise, she might have concerns about where she wants to live and how she approaches those conversations. It's really important that um, we come up with the right words and feel um, understand the importance of moving forward and having that dialogue. Um, the program that Home Instead rolled out probably now about 10 years ago, maybe longer, and I, I like it because it's really easy to remember. They call it the 4070 rule. And really the concept is when an adult child is in their 40s, typically their senior parent is in their 70s. Um, and that's the right time to start having that conversation. So um, 40, 70, but it can work the other way as well. If your adult child has been hesitant to bring up the conversation, as a seven year old, it's appropriate probably to start having those conversations with your 40 year old child um, so that you can get plans in place. And these are just a couple of example questions when it relates to uh, where a person is living. Um, in this case, like the senior daughter says something like, I know we want um, the best for one another. Let's talk about options that will work well for the both of us. And in the senior's response is, I want to remain home for as long as possible, but I need help and I can't stay here anymore. But that's what I really want to do. You know, and I, I think, again, being transparent and vulnerable and starting to have that dialogue is really important. And one of the main things I would want to encourage everybody to walk away with today is um, beginning those conversations if you haven't. So let's say you make a decision with moving forward or you're interested in in-home care. What happens next and how does it actually work? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, we would suggest just picking up a phone and um, begin sharing your story and start gathering information. Um, I know how you know Julie and my agencies work and I know a lot of our um, in-home care um, partners um, we all have the same approach to this. We are really here as a resource. We want to make sure we're providing the right um, uh, solutions for you, but call and gather information on your own and start sharing your story about where you think you may need help. Um, a lot of times we get questions just about how do I pay for it? Um, wh who funds in-home care? And there are different solutions 
Um, and I mentioned just a few here. Um, typically, it is a private pay solution, um, but there are some long-term care insurance policies that cover services. Um, sometimes there's VA benefits, and there's some agencies that also will take, um, in Arizona, it, it's called Altex. Um, so there are some solutions with helping with payment. Um, I, speaking for my own agency, we are primarily um, working with clients that are um, long-term care insurance or private pay clients. Um, the next thing would then be arranging a time for what we call a care consultation. Um, kind of a rule of thumb or something to kind of keep in your toolkit is, you know, ask the agency you're talking with is if there's a fee for them to do that. We provide that service at no cost. We come out, we will do a in-person care consultation with the senior, their family, whoever wants to be there. And that's where we can start um, providing information and evaluating the living environment and where we can best provide care. Um, and then typically there's a little bit of paperwork um, and then care can start pretty quickly. Um, I know that Julie and I both in our businesses strive to turn around care as quickly as possible. Um, you know, ideally it's great if people can be a little bit in front of some of their situations, but we also know emergencies happen. So if somebody calls us and says, gosh, mom's coming home from the hospital tomorrow, I need someone to be here at eight in the morning. We really try to do everything we can to try to meet the needs of our customers. Um, you know, we know people don't wake up today and decide suddenly, oh gosh, there's going to be an emergency that I'm going to need somebody here. So we try to be as flexible as possible. Um, but again, those conversations also maybe help you get a little bit ahead of these situations so they don't catch you too off guard. Things to think about when you're reviewing agencies for in-home care, um, you know, you start putting together a list of local care providers. Um, you know, I love talking with people, but I also understand and recommend that, you know, it's great if you can talk to a couple, compare your options. It's not just only about home and said, there's other people that do what we do and you should feel really comfortable about people you're inviting into your home. This is your, your own castle. This is where you want to stay. Let's make sure the people that are coming in are meeting your needs. Um, learn about their services, learn about their reputations, understand, you know, how do how have others felt about their services when they've come in? So ask them for their reviews and um, other things they can share that supports how well they take care of seniors. Um, ask them about insurance, how they hire their personnel, um, anything that just is more in the viewpoint of how, do the, how does it um, protect you, your interests, um, any accidents, any things like that that could happen in a home. Um, and then, of course, they should have a service agreement, some billing policies and procedures that you should understand and review with them before you move forward. And again, I know when I'm out talking with families, I'm more than happy to share all of this information and be as transparent as possible. Um, it's not anything that anybody should be hiding behind when they're having conversations about having someone come into their home. So a little bit about selecting caregivers and how agencies go about um, identifying or making sure that the caregiver has the right credentials. Make sure to ask the agency how they go about selecting. Find out what their policy is for watching over and training and or um, checking in on their caregivers. Do they have a quality assurance program? And a common question is just about consistency of staff. Am I going to have the, the same caregiver every day or is it going to be a couple of different people? Um, you know, it's OK to ask those questions and make sure that you understand expectations or you're making your expectations clear before care starts. In that same vein, for safety reasons, you should always understand if um, an agency is providing reference checks, background checks, motor vehicle checks, drug screens, um, you know, what kind of uh, things are they asking for their caregivers to be um, bumped up against or checked out against before they're actually being placed into the home of a senior? Um, 
One other common thing that we see a lot of is, is the employee um, um, part of an agency or are they an independent contractor? And depending on the answer to that, if they're working as an independent contractor, that may shift some of the burden onto um, you um, for things such as taxes or insurance. So just kind of understanding um, the difference of somebody working for an agency versus somebody working independently. Uh, we talked earlier about how we go about looking at a holistic approach to care. Again, I think it's important that someone's coming in and looking at the full situation. Um, do they provide the plan of care and what's expected in writing? Are there emergency procedures? And do you fully understand all of those programs, especially what are they doing when it comes to quality assurance and coming out to make sure that the care you're receiving is meeting your needs. Vicki, we have a question Oh, from Ellen Higgerson. Okay. Regarding credentials right now, are all of your caregivers required to be vaccinated? That's a great question. And it's something that we get asked um, quite often so and and i would ask julie to kind of give her um office's viewpoint on this as well but oh she had to step off she yeah. did tell me that <laughs> sorry um don't ask julie she's not there anymore um so for our agency we have not mandated the covid vaccine i have provided it as a solution we provide them resources to get the vaccination um, but we have allowed people to make an independent decision about receiving the COVID vaccine. But what we have done is if they have been COVID vaccinated, that is something that um, my agency uh, tracks so that we know which of our caregivers have that vaccine. Because we do have um, a lot of our clients that are requesting only COVID vaccinated caregivers to come into the home. So that's an important um, kind of expectation that you should um, talk to the in-home care provider about if that's something that's really important to you, um, that they understand that because what that does on our side is then we only would offer those shifts to people that actually have the vaccine. Um, so the, the answer to your question is no, not everybody's vaccinated, but we do have protocols around how we put that information to use. So I've spent all my time talking about home care, but I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge and um, explain that there are a lot of partners in this space that we work together with to make sure that um, everybody's needs are being met. Um, so it's very common in our home care setting that we are working with um, home health agencies hospice agencies, and then my esteemed partner over here, placement agencies. So, um, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I already have hospice. I don't need home care. Well, hospice is there for very specific tasks, kind of similarly with home health. Home health is coming in and maybe checking a wound or they're working with you for an hour every other day. Um, that's not very much care. So we often are supplementing or complementing these um, companies in our services. Sometimes people need to use home care while Rita's company is working on a placement, as another example. Go ahead and go forward. Um, and those were probably three of our primary, but we obviously want to recognize our partners such as Benavia. Um, and then we work often with fiduciaries, care managers, um, lawyers, um, think of anything kind of on that care continuum. We typically have a great list of resources and partners in the community that we know who and where to reach out to depending on the circumstance that um, we may be presented with. Oh, and there we are. <laughs> So um, that's uh, on, in the yellow dress, that's me, if you couldn't figure that out from my earlier introduction, <laughs> along with my very tall husband, Scott. And um, again, we service Sun City and Peoria. And then that's Julie and her husband, Brian, who service Surprise and Sun City. So um, while you know we're talking about care right here in the west side of the valley, Home Instead is actually well represented all over the um, 
all over Arizona, but specifically in Phoenix, there's actually eight offices. So um, you're always welcome to reach out to any of us. And if it's outside of our service area, we always make sure to connect you with the right resources. But sometimes nice to have faces and names going together. So that's who we are. And that's what we look like on a dress up day. <laughs> <laughs> And um, here's just how to contact us. The top number there is uh, Julie's information for Sun City West and Surprise and the bottom number for our office in Sun City and Peoria. And I've really enjoyed sharing this information and I'm happy to take questions um, at the end of the presentation. I know Rita's got information to share and then we'll open it up for, for discussion at that time as well. So thank you. Thank you. Am I on? You're on, Rita. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so my first slide here says a better solution for senior living. We understand where you're at because we've been there too. And um, that's exactly right. We started with my mom having a fall in her driveway, which started a series of things that just happened. Um, you know, you might have a, a major incident and you're still able to take care of things for a while until you're not. And we did bring in home care for my mother. Um, as, and as I said, when we first started, I started out with Home Instead Senior <laughs> Care. My mom was in California and um, she interviewed a couple of companies and she chose a home company that she felt comfortable with. And they started out mm, coming in maybe four hours a day and just kind of checking in on her and doing that socialization end to it. Um, and then we had to have the unfortunate um, conversation that Vicki was just talking about that we needed to take my mom's car away from her. Uh, my brother who lived down the street from her would notice almost weekly there was a new dent here and there and one day he drove past and her side view mirror was just dangling. So we needed to have that conversation and once we took her wheels away, she felt we took her independence away. So we had to ramp up having the home care company in there from four hours to eight hours. And then of course, with her dementia, the, the, the wound to her head started progressing to the point that um, it became clear that she needed round the clock supervision. Little fires started in her microwave and she would leave the door unlocked in the evening and her neighbor would come by and say, Mary, you left your door open all night. Um, so those are the telltale signs when you know it's really, um, perhaps it's time to move on to a, a better solution for that person. Now, when I worked for Home Instead, we loved clients that were able to do the, you know, the eight-hour shifts or, or live-in shifts, or I guess you have it at 12-hour shifts these days. Mm -hmm. Do you do live-in still? Um, I My agency doesn't do live-ins, but we do 24-hour care. Yeah, 24-hour care, but it's usually 12-hour shifts, which is wonderful because you're, you usually get the same caregivers. But sometimes that to some individuals that becomes costly. So that was my mom's situation. We needed to make the decision that she was not able to live in her own home anymore. So we so we do understand where you're at because we were there. We had to then um, figure out what was best for her. How long would her her private pay money endure to allow her to live at a nice large community? And then um, sometimes the communities. Um, are too cost prohibitive. So then we, we had to look at group homes and I'll get into that a little later, but there's a whole range of the care and costs to, um, for senior care. We had a question come up from uh, Fathia. How do you handle resistance about having home care? An 86 year old I know needs home care, can afford it, but does not want it. Great question, and we do some we do run into this where they think they're fine. Um, so I think it's a better understanding where their specific um, concerns are, or where we can best be of help. And then I think it's also um, about something that Rita said. There is a strong desire, understandably, for all of us to maintain our independence and control for as long as possible. So I think it's a really important part of that dialogue where they may be hesitant to let them know what they still have 
independence and control and decision making around and where home care really is supplementing that or stepping in so that it's we're not there to do everything for you. We train our caregivers around that as well. Um, you know what? If they can still put their shirt on by them, let them get dressed, let them do these things, be an extra hand there, but don't overdo. Um, and sometimes that um, helps them understand too that we're, we're there to supplement, but not overdo it for you. Um, and I think the last thing I would really say is like, what's most important to them when someone's coming into the home um, so that we can best match a caregiver that is meeting their needs and really a good fit um, so that they feel really comfortable that, you know, this, what they feel like is a stranger really can make um, them comfortable with the care they're getting. And Rita, maybe from your past experience and working for Home Instead or just even these conversations, do you have anything that you would add to that? Well, I think, and it does go back to how you were mentioning, Vicki, at some point you should have a conversation with your loved one. And it might be something that you write up a contract. Okay, mom, we understand that you want to stay at home and we want you to stay here as long as you're safe. So let's talk collaboratively. What is it that you agree to that, you know, is it you getting getting in an accident? Hopefully it's not that. I mean, my mom was having, you know, fender benders. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have it written down and, you know, is it when this happens, you're no lo longer able to take your, your own showers safely or your, my mom walked out of her house. We had round the clock. The last two months that she was able to remain in her home alone, we had round the clock live in care for her. And even with the live in care, she got up at nine o'clock at night, got herself dressed and walked out her front door and the caregiver luckily was there and said, Mary, where are you going? And in my mom's confused mind, she saw that person as, I guess, the enemy. And she turned around to swat at her as if to say, leave me alone. And the caregiver immediately got on her cell phone, called my sister. She said, I'm safely walking behind your mom. I'll stay on the phone with you, but you need to come now. She's very agitated. So, you know, you have to have conversations. At what point, mom, will you agree that it's time that we, we put you in a different environment? Yeah, and um, the other kind of piece of this is it's not forever necessarily. Right. Sometimes we start out and say, let's try it for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, once they get comfortable with it after a week or two, it tends to move forward. But it's, you have the right to stop this after one week, two weeks. We're not asking for a lifetime commitment. And again, that's kind of the control thing. If they understand, okay, I can say stop when I wanna stop, then that's all they wanna understand. That's, that's good in their mind, right? So anyways, hopefully that kind of gives you some ideas of how to approach that. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Oh, okay. is this my poll? Yep, this is your oh, okay. Poll. <laughs> um, all right, I have a little poll question in here. How many Americans live in assisted living communities? Any idea? Okay, nearly 900,000 Americans live in assisted living communities across the country. That number will double by 2030 and triple by 2040. This number does not take into account all the residents in assisted living group homes. So that's a lot of Americans being cared for outside of their home. All right, so and a lot of the uh, information that Vicki has already given you um, would be redundant on my slides. So we have a lot of comprehensive resources that are the same, but my first, um, role in helping a family is to try to connect the family members so they're all on the same page. And generally, by the time they reach me, they've already, um, or I should say usually, have exhausted the home care route because, believe me, everybody wants to stay at home. And that's the best name for your company, Home Instead. Wouldn't you really rather stay home instead? But sometimes it's just not feasible, <coughs> especially when you have children across the United States. And again, I hearken back to my own family. I'm here in Arizona. I had a brother and sister in California, one in Texas and one in New York. We were very split and yet we wanted, we all wanted what was best for my mother. So I help connect the family members. I'll have 
individual conversations. Now, of course, Zoom is the, the way to go. We, you know, we'll just get together on, a, on an evening and have an hour long powwow and figure out, are they all on the same page? Have we exhausted all the resources for their loved one to stay at home? So I will, uh, the next bullet point is I inform and I educate them as to the pricing and, and the different types of assisted living, because that is generally the, the major source of um, concern for them. How are we going to afford to have mom or dad, or, or sometimes it's both parents move into assisted living. And that's when I get to, and Vicki just mentioned some of the different ways that you can pay for this. It's, it's golden if they had the foresight to take out long-term care insurance, but we know not everybody does. Uh, then we explore, are they a veteran? Are they eligible for some aid and attendance benefits? And then of course, there's always the Medicaid if, and that's a dual um, qualifier. Not only is it just a financial need, um, they have to qualify physically. And it's sometimes one of the, the individuals in a couple, they, they're healthy and they wanna remain at home, but how do they get their loved one into a community and not have to break the bank in paying for it? So I, I will work with an elder law attorney or another resource where they can see if they qualify for Medicaid and the loved one gets to remain in their home and keep the car. So those are a little um, lengthier discussions. So that, that's part of the uh, comprehensive resources. And then um, where it says guided multiple option tour, I've been blessed with Benavia and some of my other resource partners that um, they recommend me to do what is uh, what we call plan B planning. We don't always wait until the crisis call. You might get them when they're getting out of the hospital. And I certainly get my share of those. Oh, the discharge planner told me that mom's got to go tomorrow. Um, so yeah, we, we hustle and get those done, but it's su such an easier time for everybody involved if we have, if we plan ahead of time, if, if you pick out the community or the group home you think your mom would want to go to, and I keep saying mom, sometimes it's dad, sometimes it's mom and dad, but um, if you pick out, or at least you know options in advance, some people think, well, I, I would like to go the more affordable way of going a group home, so let me go check those out. Well. The differences between a group home and a community is the community, they have their own apartment. Uh, even if it's just a little studio apartment, it's their own space. They still feel like they have a little bit of independence. In a group home, they have a bedroom in a group home. It's more like the golden girls. Everybody's living together with caregivers. <laughs> so um, it's not always the best fit for somebody that's... Um, uh, what, what I want to say, you know, without dementia, a lot of group homes take people with dementia. And uh, if you if you're going in with a um, lower functioning physical need, but you've got all, all of your mind, that could be a little depressing, especially the homes that accept Medicaid, because remember, it's a dual qualifier. It's not only the financial need, it's the medical need. So they're, when somebody qualifies for Medicaid, they really need help with several of their activities of daily living, which is the bathing, the dressing, transferring, meal prep, med management, all of those things. Is there a question? Oh, oh. can we go back to those questions? Yes. Okay. Yep, we'll cover that one. Yeah, again. just, okay. Um, okay, you can switch that slide. Um, so working with over 1,500 pre-screened options that I've personally been to in the Valley, um, I know the staff, I know the owners, There's, and sometimes the owners change. They'll, they'll sell their home or one management company for a large community will sell out to another one. So you need to be aware of those changes. Um, I'll know personally the, the families, if it's a smaller group home, I know all of the different families and I can get the, the reference checks for them, for the families that are looking into that. I'm also familiar with the profile of the current residents. If somebody says, well, you know, price-wise, we think mom would do better in a group home, but aren't they all very declined? Well, I might, I might have just been in one last week where it is a home that accepts Medicaid, but for some reason, they've got more active residents currently, so I could recommend that home. It helps to go in and really stay on top of them. I also know 
uh, from being in and out of these places, what the profile of the current residents look like. Are they high functioning? Are they talkative? Are they fun to be around? Are there a bunch of curmudgeons just sitting there in chairs watching TV? Um, it's also knowing what goes on in the homes. Of course, COVID last year and, and part of this year, it, it's it's been a challenge. They haven't allowed a lot of um, activities and entertainment into the homes, but um, it's knowing who is slowly opening the doors to that. I asked the children, what are the quality of life uh, issues for your parents? Oh, my dad used to play the violin. If you could find a home for him where there's music. Well, I know the homes that, you know, either the residents themselves also play or the owners. So I can help. I call myself a little bit of a matchmaker. I help bring it, you know, bring it together. I have to know the, the different properties. So in that case, you could think of one of my hats as a realtor. I know the properties. I have to know the pricing. I have to know the square footage of the rooms or the apartments. I have to be a matchmaker. I have to put it all together. And then there's the little social worker end to it. I have to know all of the other resources that we talked about. Maybe somebody does want to stay at home for a month and see how they do after uh, a hip replacement. So I'll bring in one of my partners, a home care company. Um, but if that doesn't work out, then the family will call me back and say, you know, we tried it. It's just not working. Um, I think we want to explore the placement. You can go to the next. One of the things, one of my um, most sought after roles is to help negotiate lower fees. Now families, they feel if they go in and they start asking for uh, freebies here or there, or to take away the community fee or to lower the pricing, that will somehow um, get in the, the way of the care that they'll give their, their loved one. Um, so they ask me to help do that, and I'm usually successful. Sometimes I can. If it's the larger communities, you know, the Brookdale, sometimes, sometimes I could even do it with the larger communities, but sometimes when they're corporately owned, there's so much, only so much um, wiggle room I have with them. I can certainly uh, facilitate better terms for them. I will write, help write them, um, help sit down with them and write into the contract certain terms and then I can um, help position them for the Medicaid benefit. It's important to know if you are thinking of looking at communities, um, not every community and not every group home accepts Medicaid. So if you know your loved one has limited resources, maybe they're in their spend down phase of their private pay money, and they might have only six months of private pay. I know the communities that they can go to that will work with you with six months. Some of the places that um, accept Medicaid are now asking for a year to two years private pay commitment before they'll allow your loved one to go on to Altex. So don't wait until your, your loved one is thoroughly out of funds before looking into the Medicaid options. Um, just making them the family aware of all of the uh, available options. I might have a daughter that lives in the surprise area and a son in Mesa. So I'll say, well, do you wanna look at the halfway point so it's convenient for both of you? So it's it's making them aware of what's, what's available to them. I, I always carry a million dollar liability insurance policy. It's just an extra buffer for you. Um, if there's anything um, that goes goes wrong with the home, the, the community, there's an extra layer of protection, protects me, but it also, you know, if there's egregious actions against your loved one, there's, you know, I carry that insurance. The informational resources, what um, Vicki has already mentioned, all of our different community partners. The comprehensive approach um, is, is, again, sitting down with um, the case manager at the hospital, the social worker, when they call me and they say that they've got somebody to discharge, I always like to go and meet the person um, in person. It wasn't always possible last year. And now again, we're doing more FaceTime assessments, but I like to go out and see firsthand what I'm looking at so I could give an honest representation to the group homes or just to the communities as to um, what they can expect this person to be able to, to do on their own. And I, and I like to say that I can meet your time constraints. 
Um, like Vicki said, you know, it's kind of tough when it's a 24 hour turnaround. It has been done, but it's not the most optimal. If you can give us 48 or hours or more, that's um, that's our best time time frame. What I do is help uh, facilitate the communication with the, the families, with the social worker, with the group homes, the um, maybe it's if it's a, a large community, I put them in touch with the marketing director for the latest information on the terms of uh, payments. Uh, you need to know that when you move to a community, they might quote you a $4,000 all-inclusive price. But once you start stacking care on top of that, there's levels of care, or sometimes they do it um, based on 15-minute increments of care. So if, if your loved one only takes, or if they're ambulatory and it takes only five minutes to get them into the shower, a nice 10 minute shower, and then, and then um, you know, drying them off and getting them out. That could be a 15 minute or rather a half hour charge for the caregiver's time. Whereas if you've got somebody that's in a wheelchair or very slow moving and it takes a whole hour, well, now you're looking at extra time. So those are the kind of things that I like to uh, make the families aware of for the care charges. It's not just the, the the rent, but the care charges on top of it. Um, and the proven process is that um, I sit down with the families and I will talk to them. I'll give them um, past experience with those individual communities and group homes. And I've got letters of recommendation from past families that have used those places I recommend. And you know, I will just prove that why I chose that particular home to recommend to them. Um, and, and by doing that, it ensures optimal <coughs> outcome. So I guess that wraps it up. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So we will uh, take your questions now. Just remember, you have to unmute yourself if you have questions. We'll go ahead and start. We had one in the chat box earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, from Sally Hall, this question's for Vicki. Says, as you know, being over 60 years of age, we are the most vulnerable to serious illnesses from COVID. What is your assurance that your caregivers are not going to expose us to COVID? And can you provide a caregiver who has had all of their immunizations? What is your, what is your liability for caregivers theft? What do you do to prevent caregivers taking advantage of clients? That's a powerful question. That's right a lot there. of questions yes. to unpack right there. I know. So I, I know I spoke already a little bit to our COVID policy, um, you know, regarding vaccinations. If a client requests a COVID vaccinated caregiver, um, we do our best to always honor that and um, to um, make sure we understand that expectation um, so that we are matching them with uh, somebody that meets that expectation. Earlier I had mentioned and um, it's kind of a unique feature of the system our caregivers use when they go into shift, they actually have to answer a handful of questions about their health. So at the start of every single day, the caregiver has to report that they do not run a temperature, that they're feeling well, that they haven't been in contact with anybody with COVID. And that's kind of another layer of assurance because if there's any of those types of questions that come back contrary to a healthy disposition, I'm immediately emailed and notified um, so that we can intervene and make sure that that's being taken care of. So um, yes, we agree, it's a vulnerable population. Can I guarantee it's almost impossible, right? Like, unless it's like going to a grocery store and guaranteeing you're not gonna get exposed. You just sometimes don't know. We do everything we can to make sure the caregivers we're putting into the home are following those standard precautions, they're masked, and they're answering those questions and are healthy. And if they're not healthy, regardless of if it's COVID or not, we don't send them into the home. Um, in the past, we might've been a little bit more accepting of somebody going in with a, a little cough or a little sneeze or something. Now, our um, direction is really, we prevent people from going into the home if they're exhibiting any sign of illness just because of um, those concerns. So hopefully that kind of puts that question to rest. Um, can you provide a caregiver who has had all their immunizations? What is your liability for caregivers 
theft. Um, yeah, we do have insurance similar to what uh, Rita mentioned. We do have a million dollars of liability as well as umbrella coverage. So uh, we are very well insured around all of those different topics. Knock on wood, um, haven't had a situation yet since I've owned the business, but absolutely understand that it's um, it, it, it can happen. And unfortunately, sometimes does happen in, cert in certain businesses. Um, what can I ensure that prevent caregivers taking advantage of a client? Um, what kind of advantage? Do yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what, you know, if there's anything specific, but... They mean abuse? Can you ask her? Uh, do they hear us? Yes. Can, can you uh, type your question of what kind of uh, at taking advantage do you mean? That's Sally. Well, it's quite common for, at our, you know, in the older populations, we hear about... Uh, caregivers going in the home and uh, convincing the client to either sign papers away oh. or whatnot. And I just wanted to know, actually, my question is, you know, you skipped over it briefly, oh. but what do you do when you're hiring a, a, a caregiver to make sure that they aren't already known as a theft or, mm -hmm. you, you know, whatnot, whatnot? Good question. Yep. So um, part of our hiring process for our, our agency is um, we do multi-layered checks. So um, one of them is um, a background check um, that is uh, around theft or any types of, um, I guess, charges that would have been placed against that individual. Um, it goes uh, multi-county across any state that they've lived in. And so sometimes those take a little bit to come back, depending on how many places our caregivers have chosen to live. But um, that is step one in our hiring process. Um, I guess maybe it's step two. After we interview them and we think they are a great candidate to care for seniors, before we would ever move forward with training them, they have to pass that background check. The background check that we do also includes a motor vehicle record check. Um, are they safe to drive seniors? Do they have transportation to get to the senior's home? Do they have an active license? Things such as that. Now, it doesn't mean they have to have a car, but I mean, there's a lot of information that's packed into that that helps us assess if they're um, safe to be sent out to care for a senior. Um, but those are, and then we drug screen as well. Um, and we drug screen at time of employment, as well as at time if there's ever an incident. Um, and we also do random drug screening in my agency. And is that a, a national information base for the criminal or whatever you were saying, they went, you went county and state and, and wherever they live, but you know, not all people are honest, you know, that's what strikes me. When you ask a question of a potential caregiver, you're taking them at their word. You're trusting them, you know? Sure. Yep. The background check company that we use is approved by our corporate organization as a preferred vendor. Um, they meet strict criteria that they actually are going into the court and county systems of where these people previously lived. So it's not that we're taking a person's word. It's actually pulling data from the court and county databases in all of the counties that that caregiver has lived so that we're getting information from those particular um, specific areas. So sometimes, like I said, it takes a little bit to get that information back um, because if they lived in a lot of states, we're actually dependent on that county to return the information to us through this background check vendor. Okay, but that agency is based on what county the potential caregiver has told them they lived. It's not necessarily covering something they may have forgot or purposely left out. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Um, no, actually, the way we enter the background check is really um, they have to provide us multiple levels of information, um, previous names, driver's license, things such as that, that actually makes this system pretty, I mean, is it foolproof? I guess I, I it's hard for me to guarantee it's 100% foolproof and somebody can override it, but it, it does... Um, ask for multiple pieces of information that allows the system to do that comprehensive check. It's just not a matter of me taking their word for it and typing in their name. It's looking for pieces of data that I have to provide to the system so that it knows how to go out and find additional data. 
So, so the way you're saying is sort of have cost references based on the information you're able to get. Okay. That's correct. Thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Does that, does that involve fingerprinting? So um, fingerprinting is not a requirement um, for every agency. Um, I do, if my caregivers have a fingerprint card on hand, um, I, you know, obviously that's some information that uh, we will accept and, and keep in our records. Um, so that's kind of an agency by agency requirement. Um, but uh, my particular agency does not require fingerprinting. Um, I think Julie is doing fingerprinting. So if she's back on the line, she could kind of speak to that. But that's not a requirement to provide in-home care in Arizona. Um, and so we, it's not necessary um, unless, again, a senior asks us that they only want somebody in that's had certain checks which is why I collect it if it's available for my um, applicants. Isn't that part of the background check though? I, I would think that that- It's not. It's not? Mm -mm. We have a question from Vicki Weaver. How about the Buckeye Sundance active adult area? Do uh, you provide home care there or do you know if there is any? That would probably be Julie's area because that's, yeah. that's uh, I don't know, it's pretty far out. <laughs> um. Is that Julie's area all the way down to Buckeye, or is there another franchise? That's there is a franchise is. for sure down in uh, Avondale area. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's that's south of us. Yes, yes. you can south. tell I'm a transplant. I'm still learning my areas. I was like, where's Buckeye exactly? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's south of us, there is a franchise south of um, Julie and my territory that serves Avondale, Buckeye, Good. Okay, Goodyear. then it would be yeah, yeah good yeah. Good yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. In their home instead. Yep. 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 And is there, I'm just going to go off track a little bit on that. Is there, is there available um, facilities down there? Like, I mean, I know you're kind of Northwest to West Valley, Rita. There I mean, are, you, you know, the Buckeye area is growing. It's really growing. And um, generally there's, there's not as many as there are here. And the ones that are, that they're building new ones, new equates to more expensive so I, you know, I'm just, just the way I was raised, I try to always save families money that my daddy taught me well. So, you know, I'll try to get them to come to surprise. Um, but yeah, they're, they're building them down there. Okay. And there's a lot of group homes going down there too. That's good to hear. And the other thing I just wanted to say that I forgot earlier is um, it's important. Uh, what, one of the things that I, I supply my people, and I actually even make them sign off on, on the sheet when we part ways, where it says that I, you know, the guided multiple option tour, if the families aren't sure what they want, whether they want a larger community or the smaller group home, we generally see four in a day. Um, and I always get the latest state reports through the Department of Health Services. There are a lot of group homes in the Sun City, Sun City West. Um, I don't know about the surprise area, but Sun City and Sun City West, because they're owned by Dell Webb and there's some homeowner association restrictions, they're not able to have um, uh, businesses run out of their home, certainly not in assisted living. They'll take in one or two seniors it's more like a, a board and care home. They'll they'll give them meals and they'll give them light care and they do not have to be licensed by the Department of Health. Once you have three, care, uh, three residents or more, you have to be licensed by the Department of Health. So buyer beware, if you see uh, advertisements on Fry's bulletin board, if that is still such a thing that, you know, that somebody's a caregiver in their home, they might take you in for less money than a licensed um, assisted living group home will take you in for, but uh, they, they may not be licensed. So I always will print out the latest state reports. There's, there's three years that the state goes back online that I could read the reports. So you can call me and say, Rita, what do you know about ABC home? And I could do a background check on it and see um, for the last three years if they've gotten complaints, if a family member you know, goes in and complains if the complaint was substantiated or unsubstantiated. Um, I see exactly what it is. Um, I can see how many citations they had, how many deficiencies. And I, um, you know, when I'm parting ways with the family, I give them the packet of those reports and I just say, please sign that I, and, and on the back of it, it says, you have been giving 
the most up-to-date state reports, including uh, any complaints, if the, if the case may be. So when, they're, when they sign that, and the reason I do that is just because a home has four or five, six deficiencies, and this goes for the communities too, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad place. You know, it's this when the state comes in, I don't know, uh, I think it's Channel 3, Dirty Dining. Uh, for those of you that lived here for a while, I, I think Channel 3, they don't do it anymore, but they used to go online or go on TV and say, um, up next, Dirty Dining, and they'll give you like two or three places that, and it could be your favorite place to eat. And suddenly you're here and it goes ding, 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 ding. It's got like seven or eight bad citations. It's like, darn, I love that place. Well, you could still go and eat there, but buyer beware. I mean, they might have cockroaches in their flower. So it's the same thing with, with home care, not home care, but um, the, the larger communities and the group homes, they may give excellent care. And just because they have a deficiency for leaving uh, their bleach under the sink and it didn't have a lock on it, it doesn't mean they're hurting your loved one or not giving good care. It's just, but it's my role to, to spell that out for you. This is the deficiencies that they received. I just wanted to chime in a little bit. I did check real quick on Home Instead, and I actually know these folks real well. Anthony and Blair Cepeda yep. are based in Goodyear. So okay. they, there is a home care down there for Home Instead. Absolutely. It's across the mm -hmm. I'm not talking group home at this point in the future, perhaps Home Care is still out. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have another question. For consultation while a patient and his family are sorting out what next step should be. Is, is that question from Sue King? Uh, for me, how much do I charge? My consultations over the phone are free. And in fact, I'm not, I don't charge the families at all because I'm compensated. Again, going back to likening it to a realtor, I'm compensated um, from the communities or the group homes that you select. And I don't, I don't have any partial ownership or full ownership in any of them. So I'm I'm not just leading you, guiding you toward those communities, you know, that pay me the most or I have ownership in. I'm and in fact, I send you out a disclosure stating that. And also on the disclosure is the HIPAA release for me, for you to give to me that um, in preparation for the chore, I'm allowed to speak about your loved one's care needs. Just in case you were wondering, um, the question was, how much do you charge for consultation? while patient and his or her family are sorting out what their next step should be, so. Oh, they don't see that screen? No, they don't see oh, that okay. screen. Oh, okay, sorry, I should they have read can. the question. They can, but yeah. they may not yeah. click on the chat box. So, so yeah, that's a very important question. Yeah. Thank you, Sue King. Um, Vicki said, asked a question, we have long-term care insurance and would like to start out with home care. I think that sounds like a great idea. Well, I would just, <laughs> I, I would make sure that that's covered in your long-term care policy. Uh, depending on when you first took it out, it sounds like you already know that, that it's covered, which is golden. I love when we get golden policies like that because again, everybody wants to stay home instead. So it's wonderful that you can take advantage of that if it says that, but you've got to read what your benefits are because the older long-term care policies that state um, it has to be in a place that has a nurse at least eight hours a day, or um, their, their language is nursing home, which back you know 30 years ago, there wasn't this proliferation of assisted living um, communities or group homes. So you need to have your, um, and, and I have sat with, with individuals and we talked to the insurance companies and we let them know that, um, you know, the, the place that they're looking at does qualify for the eight hour a day nurse. I don't know how you cover it, but I think it specifically would have to cover home care. Some of the newer policies do because everybody wants to stay home. I keep going back. Yeah. So um, with the long term care policies, again, I agree. That's that's great. If you have a long term care policy that covers home care, I, I would recommend, um, you know, if, if you're in a point where home care seems like it's a good option to make that initial call share your story and, and start having that conversation. The other thing that um, sometimes is uh, pertinent or um, 
appears in a long-term care policy is what's called an elimination period, where you have to be utilizing the services for so many days prior to a benefit kicking in. It's usually so that 90 would days. Be another question to ask or look for in your insurance policy. Um, the one thing I can speak to also that how our agency handles long-term care is we coordinate sharing invoices and the plan of care, as well as the um, different tasks that are required to demonstrate that we're doing for the benefit to kick in. For instance, um, maybe it requires that we're supporting what um, Rita used this term earlier, activities of daily living. Those would be things like the showering or the toileting or the dressing. Um, and so my agency's responsibility is that I'm documenting that in the plan of care, that my caregivers are um, saying that they've completed those tasks, because then at the end of every billing period, when we send that information to the insurance company, it allows you then to receive your payment um, from that insurance company to cover those benefits. So um, those are kind of some things to keep in mind when you're looking at your policy or even talking with agencies, how do they work with insurance companies? Um, where does that payment go to? We do not take assignment of benefits. The payment goes to you, the policyholder, um, for your benefit, and then you pay us, the agency. Fantastic. Well, we're getting close to our three o'clock um, end to the workshop, but we uh, we still have time for questions. So make sure you unmute if you'd like to ask a question, or you can continue to put them in the chat box. Uh, Thank you, Vicki, for joining us today. We appreciate it and the questions. Mm -hmm. Anybody else um, have anything for Rita or Vicki? Vicki, I like your name and I like how you spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Maya, did you have a question? I just want to say thank you. It was You're very welcome. informative and um, helpful for myself looking into my future and also helping me because I'm I'm here in Sun City with my almost 94 year old mother who drives mm, and yeah. uh, and is she's still safe but we're getting there so yeah. this is very timely for me thank you you're welcome the other thing I might like to say is and thank you Maya that was very nice to say um be the eyes to help your community, your neighbors, your church members, they may not have the um, technology know-how to be online like you all are today. So we need your help in going back and helping to share our information. And um, I don't have the slide presentation for you for my information, but my name is Rita, R-I-T-A McBride, just how it sounds. M-C-B-R-I-D-E, and the best number is my cell because I carry it 24 seven. If I'm not able to answer it, you could leave me a, a message and I will always get back to you. And my personal cell is 602-377-9922. If you don't mind, Rita, I'll go ahead and add an additional slide to the presentation. Sure. Before yeah. I turn it into a video. So oh, that'd be great. You'll have that as well on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Any other further questions? Nope. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here this afternoon and taking time to visit with us. I hope uh, you got all the information you needed. I know these women did a wonderful job. I, I, it's amazing how I, I sit at these things a couple times a month and I learn something new every time. <laughs> so I just love it. So um, just a reminder, I'll be following up with an email. And I will have the links to this presentation, the video, and the uh, PowerPoint presentation as well on YouTube. So we will have that. And hopefully you're following us on our website at benevia.org. Um, we got three workshops next month in October coming up quick. We have a uh, Smart Giving Strategies on October 14th. We have Confident Caregivers uh, in Caring for Those with Dementia on October 20th and getting your affairs in order on October 26th. So same format, Zoom format. You can sign up online on our website, it's real easy, or just give us a call here at Benavia, 623-584-4999.
and we'll make sure you got a spot on our Zoom call. So once again, thank you all for being here today. You are wonderful. Thank you again to Rita McBride and Vicki Castleman, our expert presenters today. They did an amazing job. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Bye, Bye Mom. <laughs>